you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John, John chapter 13. And last week we looked at chap- uh, verses 1 to 17, the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And this time is the, we're going to go on from that. Actually, chapter 13 is a complete unit in itself, and you'll see by the end how it is, but it, of course, far too much material to cover. In fact, I was even debating about whether to chop this one again, but uh, we'll see how our time goes. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get it all, all done here tonight, this one particular chapter. Uh, fantastic uh, chapter, um, fantastic in that it highlights who Jesus is and what he has done for us. It's an incredibly low and depressing one if you look at what happens around him, but uh, often the, the height is contrasted by the depravity uh, around it. And so that's what we're going to be looking at, uh, looking at the concepts of betrayal and denial and Jesus teaching us how to overcome these items. So before we start, let's pray. Father, we commit ourselves to you. We, uh, first of all, I commit myself to you. Lord, let me share tonight what you've got in store for each one of us. Help me to speak with clarity, simplicity, and only your words tonight. Only your words. I pray, Lord, for each one of our ears. Help us to hear. Give us ears to hear. Ears to understand. And spirits to understand and receive from you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Context of tonight is the foot washing, as I've said. Last week we looked at the, the, the surface topic was humility. And Jesus, being Lord, being the rabbi, being the teacher, humbled himself, put the towel around him, and actually went and washed his disciples' feet. Had they have been any people, it would have been sort of understandable. But a lot of these guys were not the best of characters. Um, we've got a zealot in there. Uh, they had no problem killing people. You got a tax collector in the midst. Um, People wanted to do him in. Uh, Up to seven of them at least were fishermen. They were rough, uh, rough guys, rednecks. They and Jesus humbled himself and washed their feet. Great act of humility. But it's more than that, because if you remember in in verse eight, what we looked at there, when Peter said, "No, you're not going to wash my feet," then Jesus responds to him and says, uh, "Then, um, well." Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. And then G- Peter says, well, then wash all of me. And so this here pointing that unless we allow Jesus to minister to us, and the greatest ministry he has done was go to the cross for you and for me, and we have to be willing to accept that. Unless we take that, we have no part in Jesus. And so the disciples at that time figured that out to some degree. Uh, and I say to some degree, as we'll see, but... Peter says, okay, then then wash all of me. Well, what he did then at the end of that, we concluded last week by saying in verse 17, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. He was commissioning them to serve one another. And he commissions you and me to serve one another. He's telling them, if I, your teacher, Lord, have done it, how much more among yourselves uh, to do that? And that's been the principle of the church. In fact, it was this principle that uh, basically... Uh, propelled the church in the first couple of centuries in Rome in the Roman uh, time when there were especially when there were plagues that were breaking out and many people were running off it was the Christians so history tells us that went in and many times gave up their lives in order to serve other people in the midst of these plagues and the people would stand back and say what kind of a religion is this that uh, sacrifices self for the benefit of someone else and so they took the concept of foot washing to a much higher level and actually served other people to the very end which is what he did Jesus did and he says as I have done so do that as well well that's the context from which we get into verse 18 where if your Bible probably has headers it will say something right above verse 18, something along the line of betrayal. And that's what this is, overcoming betrayal and denial. Let's take a look at the next slide, just showing the context for the next few days or for the next few sessions that are coming. Uh, Looking at that tonight, October 22nd, then looking at Jesus, the way to the Father, next week with Pastor Sherry, and then the promised Holy Spirit by Tim Daly. Looking forward to that uh, as well. Now, this 
context here, moving on now into uh, chapter, uh, verse 18, he says, there's a continuation from 17, okay? Right on a continuation. Right after he says, you will, um, now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I am not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. Let's take a look at the word betrayer for a minute and betrayal. Now, if you think about the word betrayal, a betrayer is not known until he actually betrays, correct? And it's at the point of actual betrayal, then we know this is a betrayer. But up until that point, we don't know. And this was the case here with Judas. Judas. We know it, and so we're always looking back, and in fact, the other gospel writers always refer to him as Judas, the betrayer, or the one who betrayed Jesus. So for, for ever since he did this act of betrayal, actually that a few hours from this, this episode here, just within a few hours when he actually betrayed Jesus with a kiss, uh, that has been recorded, and that's how we refer to him ever since, the disciples his peers refer to him as that way, as a betrayer. But up until this time, right up until this time, he's not known as a betrayer. He is known as one of the twelve, a disciple of Jesus, an apostle, a called one. That's who he is. And so when we're looking at that, we read betrayer into it, but it's not there in clarity until we get to this point here where Jesus now begins to uh, peel off the uh, externals. Now, you remember the, um, you've, you've read, read novels or, or watched movies of the, the spy movies and where you have the, um, the secret agents and then you have double agents and then the agents who, are, who, who uh, sell themselves out and, and all that stuff. And the thing is, when you're, when you're reading a story or, or watching a film, you don't know who they are until that moment. But something interesting happens here because before, before he does it, Jesus says, there's a betrayer here. Very interesting. Well, in our, uh, just taking a look at our culture, if we, and I think most cultures would be the same, is that when we look at the concept of betrayal, the word itself, you say, oh no, that, that's not a good word. And I'd never want to be a betrayer, okay, on the surface. However, let's just look at it from a flip side here. If one betrays an evil person, is that good? You don't have to answer. Think about it. But isn't that exactly what the police do and the secret service police? They disguise themselves we had this weekend, we just finished a conference on uh, living free, freedom, about uh, trying to help people who are on addictions of one sort or another, be it alcohol or drugs or different things. They, and, and what happens when the police are trying to, to bust uh, uh, the, the whole chain of the drug movement, what they do is they get people on the inside and they act like one of them, behave like one of them and speak like one of them and get all the information. And then at a certain point, what do they do? They betray them. And so we begin to take a double take on this word betrayer, that even in our cultural norms, in our society, that if one betrays an evil person for the purposes of the good of everyone, well, that's good. That's okay. In fact, if the police does his job well, he'll get a promotion for betraying someone. Okay? Okay? Um, however, if you betray a good person, that's not good. And then society puts you down. And I think most cultures would have these. And these are what we call these cultural norms, things that are acceptable and things that are not acceptable. And a lot of it has to do based on motive and what's the outcome. What's the final outcome for everybody? Um, in, my, in my haste, I forgot to put the... The, uh, the slide in, but there's a, a story by Don Richardson. He has written a book 
from the tribes people in Papua New Guinea. And I don't know if any of you have read the book. Maybe if I could see a show of hands. How many have read the book Peace Child? One. Two of us. <laughs> okay. It's the next order in for a shepherd shop. It is a missional classic. And Don Richardson and his wife are a young couple, and they're in a, in a boat going down this, this, this river, going into this tribe in Papua New Guinea. And it's not until they're, they're in the boat going down there that the guides are telling them, they're going in as missionaries, are telling them that this is the tribe that are both uh, headhunters and cannibalists. And they're like, oh... <laughs> <laughs> is there a reverse in the paddle? <laughs> but they go anyways. They go there. And they get involved with this, and it's a fantastic story. But one of the things that they learned about that tribe is that this particular tribe honored treachery. Betrayal was one of the highest values that anyone in their culture could attain to. As they got to know, there's a young couple with their baby, as they lived there and got to know them, and, and they had found out that just a short time prior to their arrival in that particular tr tribe, that a few months prior to that, one of the other tribesmen had, had come there and had ministered or had, had, had made friends with them. They, this, this tribe had made friends with this foreigner from the other tribe, okay, made friends with them, always partied with them and, and uh, dealt really well with him. And uh, although they knew these are enemy tribes, but they lured this guy into thinking that he's, a, that he's acceptable. He's acceptable. And once they had him fully believing that he's accepted in one of their uh, uh, meetings, they, they killed him and ate him. And they were so rejoicing because they were able to deceive him. Uh, so here's this young missionary couple now in this and they're being accepted and they're being welcomed and they're being fed and they're being told this story <laughs> of treachery. How did he find out about this? It was when he was teaching this right here, the New Testament story of Judas. When he talked about Judas and how we see Judas as absolutely despicable and how dare someone betray someone this whole tribe just erupted and applauded and said, this is our hero. And Jesus, ah, not that good. And he realized, we've got a, a message to preach. <laughs> but there's a picture, and that's why they went there. There's a picture of a culture that has absolutely deteriorated to take the evil and, and honor it and take the honorable and make it despised. And say, who is Jesus? He let, the, he let them kill him when he had all the power to, su to sustain his life. And so anyways, it's a tremendous story. You can read the rest of the story yourself to see what happens. Fantastic. And it's also in a video form as well. They've made it. And, uh, and uh, that's about 50 years ago that that story happened. Uh, that man is still alive. Don Richardson and his wife are, are still uh, there. Okay. Betrayal. When we think of betrayal, we think of some internal vengeance that must harbor inside. And when you study the life of Judas, as little as we have, but surprisingly compared to the other 12, he's mentioned a lot, comparison because some of the other disciples are not mentioned at all, you find something in his heart that is absolutely self-centered and selfish. Betrayal was only the external result of something that happened on the inside. And that's one of the things we learned this weekend as well here at the uh, Teen Challenge uh, Conference, is that all of these addictions are the, are the result of inner conflicts and needs that cannot be met. So we find this here in uh, Judas. So let's take a look at his, um, his uh, bet betrayal here. Verse 18, Jesus says, I am saying these things to all of you. I know the one I have chosen, 
But this fulfills scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. And this is found in Psalm 41 and verse 9. If you can turn to that, it's a, it's a very uh, brief psalm, but Jesus here quotes this in 41 verse 9. And it, a bit of elaborated here, it says here, even my best friend, I'm reading from the New Living, even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food has turned against me. And so picture it now, he's with his 12 disciples who he trusted and they trusted him and this is what he says he quotes this and then he goes on now in verse 19 I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens you will believe that I am the Messiah if you remember they don't know what Jesus knew nor do they knew, know what you and I know and they were sitting there, and they are fully expecting, fully expecting that everyone is on the same page. They're all going in the same direction. They're all there with Jesus to go forward. And this, then Jesus says that. And I am sure this flew over their heads. And when John writes this, he writes this in light of John chapter 20 and verse 31. And we've said that from the beginning since we started uh, this series. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, and that by believing in him you would have life eternal. And here, very clearly, Jesus says already ahead of time why he is quoting this. He says, I am telling you this beforehand so that when it happens that you will believe. And I'm sure after it happened, they remembered it and go, that's right, Jesus told us about this. And their faith in him would have increased at that time. Betrayal predicted is there to reinforce the belief. Well, go on to verse 20. Here's now another one of these amen, amens. This one here, this amen and amen, again, it's one of those things where now you sit up at the edge of your seat and say, okay, what's going on here? What's being said? He says here, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me, and anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Well, if this is the case, this shows us the extent or the depravity of the, of the, de, pre, the de, uh, denial or, uh, sorry, the betrayal that has happened here. Because anyone who betrays is going to be betray Jesus is going to betray the Father. Because he says, anyone who welcomes me welcomes the Father. And betrayal, by I guess if you could, could put a definition, would be the extreme opposite of welcoming. And this was what, for example, that tribe in uh, Papua New Guinea, that's exactly what they believed, that they went to the extreme opposite in order to lure in people from the other tribe so that when they felt incredibly welcome, then they killed them and ate them in order to take revenge on what that tribe had done before. And you could just see how that would escalate, and that's exactly the nature of sin. Sin escalates. And the other tribe would try to do it back to them as well. And Jesus is saying here, Amen and Amen. I'm telling you the truth here. Welcoming me welcomes the Father. But the opposite is also true. Anyone who disowns me denies me, betrays me, denying God the Father. Well, let's look, go on to verse 21. Now, Jesus was completely troubled. Uh, this, this translation isn't the best here. The, the more accurate one here, and I think I have it up here. Um, yeah, the next slide, please. 21a. Uh, it says here that uh, having said these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit. His spirit was troubled. It's not just this, in, uh, betrayal is not just an issue of, uh, of saying or doing something. Betrayal is an issue of the spirit. The very heart of man, the very nature of man, the very essence is what's being uh, d dysfunctional here and being sidetracked. And the, and the act or the speaking of betrayal or any action is simply the outlet of that. And so Jesus' spirit was troubled because it was a troubling spirit that was within uh, Judas. 
And this is why it's very important when we look at, for example, 1 Corinthians. If, if you uh, please turn to me, uh, turn with me to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, and we, we know the list of the gifts of the Spirit that are there. There's about nine of them, but very, very distinctly, here is a gift that is so desperately needed. And Jesus here exercises this gift of the Spirit. It's a discerning of spirits. In some translations in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, it says here, And he, the Holy Spirit, gives one person the power to perform miracles, another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to, to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. And so we simply shorten this down and call it the gift of discerning of spirits. It's what spirit is operating within that. And Jesus' spirit was disturbed because he knew the spirit of man. He knew the heart of man. He knew the spirit of Judas at this time. And it wasn't good. It definitely wasn't in, his, uh, in Judas' favor. He had a chance to change, but he didn't change it. Could have changed his heart. Didn't change it. 21b goes on here to say, Jesus says, another amen and amen. So it happens here a couple of times. Amen and amen. One of you will betray me. One of you. Now imagine in the room now, you're sitting there, there's 12 of you and Jesus, and you're sitting there and Jesus says, one of you. He's not sitting with the 70 or the 500 or the thousands in the multitude. He's just with his 12. And he says, one of you will betray me. This is not some kind of a sideliner, but an insider, one on the inside. Tough, tough things to happen. As I'm talking about this here, I'm sticking pretty well strictly to the text here, but maybe you're at, at work, something, some situations going on, and we heard it again this week, and someone was just sharing from their heart about things that are happening at work and how they try to stand up for righteousness, try to stand up for truth and, and uh, don't accept bribes or don't give bribes and um, do things fairly, do things by the book. And there's opposition that comes that way. Very definite opposition that comes that way. All, if, if, if you want opposition, just raise your standard. And you don't want opposition, lower your standards. Well, we're called to maintain high standards and higher and higher standards that are there. And I hear testimonies of people at workplaces who felt betrayed by colleagues or superiors or subordinates or different categories. And I want us in, in, to, to go through life learning the lessons of Jesus. There, there's betrayals in marriages. There's betrayals in families, children with parents. Betrayals in church betrayals in communities, betrayals all over the place. And this passage of Scripture, I believe, as John is writing it, not just is he recording history so that we have a nice story to read about Jesus persevering through his betrayal, but rather the principles and what allowed him to go through that. Well, one of the things we see here is that uh, Jesus knew what's coming. And let me tell you, <laughs> we know what's coming Blessed are you when all men persecute you for my name's sake. It is coming. Betrayal is guaranteed for a child of God. Guaranteed, 100%. It's just oftentimes we don't recognize it or see it. So what do we do? We keep our head up and we keep going. We keep soldiering on. We keep moving on. We know it's going to come. So when it comes and when it happens, don't be shaken. Jesus wasn't shaken. In fact, he's predicted. He said it's coming. And it's not like we're going through life as a pessimist and saying, oh, it's horrible, it's cloudy, it's bad, it, the sky is always gray. No, the clouds are there. Yes, there's rain. Yes, there's clouds. But we know that the sun is shining behind, and therefore we keep going. So we carry our umbrella, whether it's for the rain or for the sunshine. <laughs> carry the umbrella and keep going. And when tough times come, deal with it. When good times come, enjoy it. And this is the, some of the principles that Jesus is giving to us. Well, let's take a look at Judas, the betrayer, in verse 22. Uh, actually, this whole passage, 22 to 29. This is amazing. I, I, when I was rereading this uh, in preparation for this here, I just, amazing, amazing. The, uh, the, the layers, 
the layers of betrayal that uh, Judas went through. Verse 22, the disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. And the disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him and asked, who is he talking about? So that disciple leans over to Jesus and says, who is, who is he? It's probably John himself, the author here, who was leaning next to Jesus. And Jesus responded, it is the one whom I give the bread, a dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of son of Simon Iscariot. And when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was their treasure, some thought Jesus was going to tell him to go and pay for the food or to give some money to the poor. Take a look at verse 22 again. The disciples looked at each other. He just finished saying, one of you is going to be trained. So they all look at each other and say, who's it going to be? Had Judas, I mean, the guy was a, a betrayer par excellent. Par excellent. This verse shows us that. Because had he have been loose and not trying to cover up his tracks, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, we would think by now that all the other 11 would kind of look over and say, yeah, it's him. <laughs> but they didn't. This is how well the guy disguised himself for three and a half years. I heard a message about Judas. In fact, you can look it up on... Uh, on YouTube, John MacArthur, I found out that he actually did his dissertation uh, on this. And, and he uses incredibly hard words about Judas. And I remember hearing that some time ago, and it wasn't until I went through it and studied it myself, I realized we, but some of the hardest terms we can use are still making him look nice. For three and a half years, so disguised himself, that even the other 11, when Jesus said, one of you, looked at each other and said, who? And then he takes the bread, the morsel, dips it in, and says, the one whom I give the morsel, gives it to him. How much more evidence do you need? The one who I give the morsel to. Here, Judas. And the others still don't recognize it. They still say, it can't be him. I mean, this guy is a betrayer par excellence. Verse um, 26, in the translations, this word uh, morsel is quite interesting. Our, our, the translation I read from New Living actually says bread, but it's actually a piece. It's a small, uh, 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 just a little bit of something, some, some food. It's a morsel. It's a little piece. And, and here it just reminds me when I think of uh, communion that we have, uh, we, we hold a small piece of, of bread in our hand. And Jesus said, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. This is a piece of Jesus, a small piece. And he gives him a small morsel, a portion. And um, passes by, passes by down to verse 29. Since Judas was their treasure at the end, right after the... In, and Jesus tells him, go hurry, right? Do, do what you're going to do. And then still verse 29, here it is. And Judas, since Judas was their treasure, some thought that Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or to give money for the poor. Later when they found out that he's betraying, you can see that how hurt the other 11 must have been, recognizing that not just did he betray Jesus, he betrayed them, and not just at that time, but for the last three and a half years that was there. And perhaps he started off good. We don't know. We don't know much about him. But, but, but for three and a half years with the Son of God, and then to betray him, wow. Well, verse 30 says, darkness falls on the betrayer. It says, having gone out, and therefore, um, or having received this mor morsel. Um, let me just pause for here. Uh, having received, verse 30, having received this morsel, okay, a part and a portion. This is now the second incident, probably within minutes, uh, 10 minutes, maybe half an hour, the second time that Jesus 
does an outstanding act to him. Dips it in and gives it to him first. Isn't John next to him? Isn't that his beloved? Isn't Peter the vocal spokesperson? Aren't there others who we read so much about, but he gives it to him first? And then what did he do a half an hour prior to that? He washed his feet. I got to identify with the disciples, right? I got to identify with them. Um, he says, go do likewise. Um, could, could we, could I, could I wash the feet of someone who I knew as Jesus knew that he's going to betray him to death within a few hours? All of a sudden puts the, the foot washing at a much, much heightened contrast of how Jesus humbled himself to even serve the one who's going to betray him. But he did. And Judas has such a seared conscience, doesn't even fizz on him at all. He takes the morsel and heads out in the night. Says he went out immediately. Um, What's interesting here, uh, (laughs) understanding the, the nature of fishermen, and with at least seven or eight of them as fishermen, as I mentioned, a zealot, a tax collector. Uh, these guys had their own uh, way of dealing with things. They're not passive, quiet characters, and it comes out in Peter. Um, if they fully would have grasped who Judas was, if they really would have got the depth of the betrayal, I would think that perhaps Peter, being the first, would jump up Right? As, as Judas is leaving, tackle the guy, bring him down and not let him out to betray his master. Because Jesus just finished saying when he's going to betray. And he would like to show him a nice um, form of, uh, of discipline. He's a rough, rough guy. Fishermen were rough. Zealots, they wouldn't use a fist. They, they didn't bother with that. They just took a knife and killed someone. Okay? Tax collectors had no problem ripping other people off before. And here's one of their own. Can you imagine what if they would have fully grasped it. I don't know, we can't imagine. I just put myself in their position and say, well, obviously they didn't get it. And if they would have got it, what would they have done? Well, that's back then. That's 2,000 years ago. You and I don't live there. We live today. And so what do we do to those who betray us? What do we do? Good question, huh? He goes out. Moreover, it was night. Well, that's what happens. That's what happens when you walk away from the light. You walk away from the light, you go into darkness. Light exposes evil. And as the light of Jesus shines, evil has to run. Thank God, evil people have a chance to transform. And so when the light of Jesus shines on each one, and all of us were there, all of us were hostile to God, foreign from Him, alienated from Him, hostile in our thinking and our mind towards God. And when the light of Jesus shone on you as it did on me, we had a choice to make. And we either welcome the light and accept it and be transformed and then begin to live in the light and then begin to radiate the light or we run away into darkness. Darkness welcomes evil. Jesus said, whoever welcomes me welcomes the Father, and evil people cannot welcome Jesus because Jesus is the light, and if Jesus is there, darkness has to flee. And this is a whole theme in John as well, the whole concept of light and darkness that is here, and Jesus came as the light to shine. Well, let's move on now. Because in chapter, this is the first half of 13. The second half of 13 moves on to the topic of denial. In chapter 13, we've, the first 30 verses deal with teaching on servanthood, a teaching lesson, a teaching demonstration. It's an acted, uh, an acted out teaching session. But it's followed by betrayal. And Jesus finishes washing his disciples' feet, and then comes the issue of betrayal. The second half of chapter 13 is Jesus is going to teach about love. 
And let's see what happens after that. Verse 31. As soon as Judas had left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. So as soon as this element of darkness has left, we're left with the eleven and Jesus. And I have put up here uh, trans, uh, as close as possible to the Greek. So let's go to 31 and 32. We'll put this now. Uh, back one, please. Back one. Now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and will glorify Himself immediately. Any ideas to what the theme is? And they're all there in the Greek. Glory. The glory of Jesus. If, if it says in verse 32, if God is, is glorified in him, which he is, God will therefore also glorify himself, him, or glorify him, that is Jesus in himself, and will glorify him immediately. Uh, we can take a look here now at the beginning of John because something that John said right at the beginning is unfolding throughout the book. And here's where it actually comes to a, a climax. We, I, I always used to think that glory is climax there in the, um, in the cross, which in many ways is lots of mountain peaks. But here, very interesting. Let's take a look first of all at John 1.14. John 1.14, right at the beginning, there is something here that John says, and I know we discussed this when we went over this first. But in John 1.14, it says here, So the Word became flesh and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And it says here then, we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Well, how have we seen his glory? And when you, we who are 2,000 years after this verse read that, it's very easy to read it and just put the whole package together. The glory of Jesus is revealed when he's dying on the cross, your sins and my sins, and then he's buried and then he's resurrected again, and then he's ascended. We take the whole thing there and say this is the glory that Jesus came to bring. But look at this verse here, back that we're studying in chapter 13. Look what it says here. He's there in the room with his disciples. Already the one is on his way to betray him. And the next one is on his way to deny him. In the midst of betrayal, between betrayal and denial, Jesus says this, Now the Son of Man is glorified. Now, now, not a few hours from now, but now is glorified and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and will glorify Him immediately, pointing to another glory. And so all along we've seen Jesus being glorified in different forms, mountain and transfiguration and so forth. But this time, well, as I sat back and I go, well, now, why, why now? Why? At the sitting around the table, how can you be glorified sitting around having a party with your friends? What's the glory in that? How does the glory of God reveal itself in that? Well, I, I see it here, not that they're sitting there having a party and having a good time, because Jesus sure knows that in a few hours it's not a big party time coming. The other disciples still think it is, even though they've been told that he's going to die, they're still thinking of Jesus coming and bringing in the kingdom, and they're still looking forward to even a greater celebration. Um, but it says here, uh, amidst, in the midst of betrayal, in the midst of denial, is glorified. You know, we, we, um, we say this sometimes and, and, and even perhaps even sing it, you know, Lord, we want to see your glory. Let your glory shine. Well, you read this and go, do we, do we understand glory? Do we get it? And I ask myself, do I get it? Do I understand what does it mean to have the glory of God come down? And in the context here, the glory of God is revealed in the midst of betrayal and denial. You want to see full glory? You can experience full denial, full betrayal. When you read church history, 
So the men with the greatest glory that they received on this earth were the ones who laid down their life for the cause of Jesus Christ, starting with the disciples that were there. And you can read about that 500 years ago as the Great Reformation started to take place, how many people lost their lives. Great glory, great glory. And we talk about these great reformers. But look at the cost at which it came to them. And us as humans, many times we don't know what's coming, but Jesus knew exactly what's coming. And then he makes this statement. Glorify. Glorify. Well, let's move on. Verse 34. He says here, he says to them, uh, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another. Uh, this word new can be also a fresh, a fresh commandment or an unused commandment, a novel commandment. And um, we, there's lots of different ways you can look at it. You can look at it as a new one compared to the Old Testament or just simply back up a few minutes prior to this and what was the commandment there? Serve one another. That was the commandment. And so we say that's enough of a commandment. That's already a heavy enough of a commandment. But just a few minutes later after giving that commandment, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. And it's not just any commandment or like the previous one with words only, but rather with demonstration. Because he said, serve one another, and he demonstrated it. Now he says, love one another, and he's going to demonstrate the full extent of his love by giving up his life for them. And, and, offer forgiveness for those who betray him, deny him, kill him. It doesn't matter. That's the extent of the love that Jesus has. He gave it back then, and he's still giving it today. All of us were born in sin and hostility towards God, yet he loved us so much. Why? Why, why would we do this? Verse 35 answers the question, why, why this commandment? It says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. By this love, they will know. John 17 picks it up again. He picks it up in different places. By this love. Um, again, we have cultural norms, okay, just as we looked at that for betrayal. Let's look for a minute at cultural norms about uh, this here, about the whole thing about denial. Um, we, you know, again, the word deny, to deny is, is a negative word. And we don't like it. And we try to avoid it. However, in our culture, most of our cultures, we use denial, and sometimes even denial is honorable to a degree, okay? How is that? Well, Look at the nature, right? The nature of man. And it starts off with little kids. You tell the little kid, don't, no cookies out of this cookie jar. What does the kid do? Gets a cookie. Crumbs are all over the chin, down the hair. Do you take any cookies? No. <laughs> Denial. Why? And, 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 and it's, it's good. It's good that the child denied. Why? It shows the child has a conscience. Now, it's not good that they lied. So you deal with that. But the first reaction as a parent is at least you recognize the child still has a conscience. Okay? And is, has, okay, I got, a, I, I got a dilemma. The little kid's trying to figure this out. I got a dilemma because I know I did wrong. Now that's, that's on the negative side. Um, or with friends. Okay, if there's a bad person. Okay, let's say there's a bad person and, 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 and the, the police are about to, to, to jump in on someone. And you're walking there. Well, the last thing you're going to do is admit that you know that person. So you're going to deny you ever know that person, knew that person. It's for your benefit, right? And we accept that in our culture. That's acceptable. Not that, again, not that it's right, but it happens. Um, but let's look at the flip side. Look what we do with good deeds. With good deeds, we're willing to boast about them, Right? brag about them, talk about them. Good friends were willing to do that. If someone's going to be honored and someone's going to be receiving some praiseworthy commendation and you know that person is your friend, you stand up straight and you say, that's my friend. Well, 
Here, look what happens. Um, Peter is going to deny the very person he should stand up and say, this is my friend. He wasn't, Jesus wasn't a bad person. He was a perfect person. Perfect. Why did, why did Peter deny him? Why? Why? Questions go through our mind. But then again, we put ourselves in his position. And you begin to see the environment, as we'll look later, the environment that he was in. Because his own skin was on the line. And because of his own interests, his own self-interests, he was willing to shun himself from the very person who offered life to him and can only offer life to him. And so we say, God, help us at all times. And isn't that what Jesus said? Anyone who denies me in front of others, I will deny in front of my Father. And there is a denial. And Jesus will deny even knowing you and me if we deny him on this earth. This is the severity of denial. We look at Judas as this betrayer and how horrible and correctly and despicable and disgusting that he, he betrayed Jesus. But denial is equally as bad because I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before the Father one day and Jesus, when the Father turns to Jesus and says, do you know Gerald? And then Jesus says, don't know him. Don't know him. Never knew him. He'll deny Jesus will deny people if we deny him. Very tough. These are tough words that are being said here. Very tough. Peter says in verse 37, I'm ready to die for you. That's what he says. And then we have another amen and amen. And Jesus says, oh really? Is that right? Look at verse 38. Die for me? I tell you the truth, amen and amen. Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times, not just once, but three times, that you even know me. Wow. Well, let's summarize this. Let's close off this evening. Summarizing chapter 13, we have some lessons to learn. Is that we are called and we are commissioned to serve one another. It doesn't matter even if we're betrayed doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what other people do to us. We're called to serve one another. We're called to love one another, even if we're denied. This is tough, but it's Scripture. And Jesus just didn't say it. He demonstrated it for us. And then he says, come, follow me. Follow in my footsteps. Do as I do, just as Jesus did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We commit ourselves to you again tonight. A few decades after this happened, uh, Paul, who had been a persecutor of the church, uh, he, he didn't call himself a denier or a betrayer. He, he just outright killed Christians. He just wanted to make sure that they're dead and they're gone and they're out of the way because he saw them as, uh, as opposed to the to the religious structure at that time. And then he writes, however, he says, uh, all those who live godly will suffer persecution. But he doesn't leave us there on a negative note. What he does is he also reminds us again of who it is we're following. And this is what I want to encourage us tonight. And it's filled in my heart to, to close with this, is that we walk out of this place tonight understanding that Jesus has gone on before us. He got down and he washed his disciples' feet. He took the, the denial of Peter in stride. He knew he was going to do it. And he restored him. We'll get to that. He restored him. He said, go back and feed my sheep. I understand. And Paul, a few decades later in 2 Timothy 1, 7, writes, For God did not give us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And I just want to encourage us as, as Christians that we are the lights of the world. We reflect the light of Jesus. And you and I, no matter what happens in our families, in our homes, in our communities, at workplaces, that we live with an, a standard of integrity. We have a standard that the world will uh, look towards. 
and say, how can I have that? How can I have this strength? And of course, we don't have it in ourselves. We've got it, but because of the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus has given to us. And so I just want to encourage us that each one of us have been given the power and the authority in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit to attain to a higher standard of living. Now, we don't succumb to the things that the enemy tries to throw against our weight. And let us live with victory. We sang that song tonight. Thank you so much for that song, Victory in Jesus, because that's exactly where it's at. We can't have that kind of victory in ourselves. We can't. To go through this kind of betrayal and denials. But in Jesus, we can. Amen? Amen. 